You're just going to fillet this sucker right off the bone. Hey, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Fish Out Northwest, waiting on Tommy Donlan. This is what you call a bait stop. Welcome to Fish on Northwest, winning on Tommy Donlan. Uh, back here in studio once again, buddy. You took a week off. Yeah, I had to. I had to make sure that I was tan. Get the tan roll. And I got it. Yeah. 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 It looked like it worked out well for you. It did. It was a great trip. We we're going to talk a little bit about that later on because it looked fun and exciting, full of sun, full of fish, and full of fellowship. Was it like was. Good time. It was. Yeah. So, uh, hey, welcome everybody to the show tonight. So glad you could join us. Yes, we are live here from the Fish Hunt Northwest studio located here at Summit Lake in Olympia, Washington. I want to thank you all for tuning in. For tuning in on Root Sports, uh, fantastic. Uh, let folks know you find us either live on Thursdays or Root Sports on Sundays here at 9 a.m. We love to bring you the content each and every week. It's relevant, it's within time, and it's something we strive to to uh, to complete each and every week. So, um, with that, Tommy, there are a few things going on. Um, catch the memo, Columbia River closure to uh, all salmon and steelhead fishing. Mm -hmm. I did see that. Yeah. I did see that. Yeah. <laughs> so That was unfortunate. It, well, it's, uh, it's due to a few things, right? First of all, we had this tremendous, tremendous preseason forecast. Then it kind of fell on its face. Mm -hmm. And then we dealt with uh, extreme cold weather conditions. And it's been a battle to, uh, to find fish. And then the fishing is like, oh, they reopen it for a, another week. Right. We have extremely high right. flows because of because of snow melt, right? And uh, we've been tracking this thing all along. And then they they say, hey, we're going to extend it on through June fifteenth, sixteenth, which then you know rolls right into summer open fishery, mm -hmm. and we're off and running. They come back a few days later. Wah, wah. Hey, yep. emergency closure uh, mm -hmm. due to some over harvest on the upper stretch above Bonneville mm -hmm. by the co-managers, right? It's out there in in uh, in print here. Um, and so we have an allocation discrepancy and we have a, you know, a harvest discrepancy. And, you know, last time I looked, recreationals have kept to this date 4,323 fish, which is not even quite 50% of our, our allocation. Right, right. And then, you know, if you look at the non-treaty total, mm -hmm. you really have about 19,446 fish that have been kept. Mm -hmm. But that still leaves a balance of 4,154 fish left. Now, again, that's the non-treaty balance. Non-treaty commercial or non-treaty? Non-treaty commercial. Commercial. Yep. Yeah, and the non-treaty commercial. I mean, they got a pretty good chunk of the pie this year. Mm -hmm. um, and they're not going to get to go after their remainder of fish on the table. They had some yeah. selective dates here. Young's Bay Fishery Lower River. Mm -hmm. Um, getting into the, you know, towards the end of, or start of June here, uh, which has been shut down. All fish right. has been shut down. So we had a, we had a, uh, a treaty catch of 11,990, almost 12,000 fish, 113% of their allocation. Right. Uh, 1,400 fish over their allocation. Yep. Um, talked to a few folks. One indicated that it was a tremendous effort by, by the dip net fisheries and the upper stretches. We had a uh, pretty pretty robust amount of fish coming through for a few days or a week or so. The dip net fisheries were just crushing it, and um, that led to over harvest. And you and I are kind of on the fence of going, it's in between dams. We count numbers. We count mm -hmm. fish coming in. Is it really that hard to track? Is it really that hard to stay on top of this, mm -hmm. right? And uh, apparently, at some points, it, it is. Uh, you know, and it, the, thing that, the thing that there's a couple things that are interesting about this. So, you know... Sometimes the fishing is so good that you have to have a daily management, mm -hmm. right? You and I talked about before the show that on the recreational take last year, our impact of the toolies went 200%. Yeah. Right? So all, With all, that opener with, of non-select for four or five days. Exactly. We exceeded exactly. our quota by 200%. And so when you look at, you know, just four or five days, yeah. the impact that fishing can have on, you know, the overall run and projection, um, it's not, you know, now here we're talking... You know, not 100% over, we're talking 13% over. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I can see how that can happen. And, and I, don't, I don't know that that's necessarily egregious. 
However, the thing that is very interesting about this is that they were over 1,408 fish for their particular um, quota, right? And their catch was 11,990. Yep. Now, the thing that's really interesting about this is the non-treaty commercial balance to go is 4,154 fish. Mm -hmm. Well, 1,400 fish doesn't even eat, you know, it maybe takes, a, you know, a third of that, right? You still have 3,000 fish there, um, give or take, that you can go after for that mm -hmm. non-treaty catch. But it's interesting because they didn't say, well, hey, non-treaty, you know, commercial, we're going to let you go ahead and go fish those. Or, hey, recreational guys, we're going to let you go finish out your quota because you got 50% left. Yeah. They just said, hey, we're shutting it down. So I found, I found that part to be interesting. There is a Snake River component in there that's mm -hmm. highlighted as they're fearful of the impact of the Snake River uh, abundance of fish. And so when you can't calculate how many of those are going to actually now make it above Bonneville and up mm -hmm. to the upper stretches and get there, mm -hmm. they got to close it down at the lower end too because they can't, they can't guarantee there's no interception of those needed fish for that particular run. Yep. And as we know, with our Puget Sound experiences, certain rivers and systems impact an entire fishery. Right. And this is exactly what's going on down there. So uh, we could go on about this one for quite some time. We just wanted to get it out there mm -hmm. to say, hey, it's shut down, shut down through June 16th until um, we can get our summer opener. And it's just unfortunate uh, fisheries mm -hmm. management. It's a daily, daily grind, it daily is. activity. It so, is. All right, real quickly, running down the show before we run out of time here, Thomas. Uh, Kyle Bushelman joining us, Lamont Valley Outfitters, LLC. Lings, Kings, Rockfish, and Coho. Oh, my. This opportunity down in Oregon, something to take a look at. Ross Walker, board member at Rods and Reels of Need, second annual. It's the Fish Expo 2023, all that is going on and why you should plan to be there. This is going to be a good one, Tom. You can't wait. Uh, FHN, quick tip. Are you running Raymarine Autopilot? Here's how easy it is to use and why you should be. Bait Lab, Coon Shrimp Cure, Summer on Steelhead, and get you ready for Sockeye. Uh, pay attention, get your notepad out. And then, of course, we'll recap kind of coming up events, La Push, Lincoln Derby. We're going to cover Triploids, Kokanee, Summer on Steelhead, Tommy, Ocean Opportunities. We'll catch you up on all those. And then we're going to close out the show. Uh, check out what you had going on down there in the Bahamas, Tommy mm -hmm. Bahama. And then, of course, today was the resident coho opener, Area uh, 10, and Chinook Opportunity, Area 11. How did it go? Yeah. Man, we got some reports for you. Stick around. You're going you're gonna to want to get all those. All right, don't go anywhere. Jump out for a quick break. We'll be back with Kyle Bushelman getting some updates out of Oregon right here at Fish on Northwest. Defiance Marine is the one-stop shop for the Pacific Northwest Angler. Defiance Marine guarantees the best price on a new and best service on a repower for your current boat. Defiance Marine is a Honda Premier dealership and one of the largest on the West Coast. Defiance Marine is a boat dealer who proudly sells Defiance, Allied, and Arima boats. All boats are built by West Coast fishermen for West Coast fishermen. Defiance Marine has all your boating needs to help you get out on the water. If you're looking for the best fishing rods in the world, you really do need to take a look at the edge rods. I designed and built new machinery, and I think this new machinery has enabled us to build blanks like no other company can build without this equipment. There is no other rods in the world that are as good as these rods. You owe it to yourself to take a good look at them. For more than 90 years, you've entrusted one brand to guide you toward living the lifestyle you've always dreamed of. Now you can entrust affiliated Better Homes and Gardens real estate professionals to interpret your needs and help you find the home in which to live your dream through every stage of your home buying or selling process. And through every stage of your life, there's Better Homes and Gardens real estate. Expect better. All right, welcome back to the show. Dwayne England, Tommy Donlan, welcoming a no stranger to the studio. Good buddy, Kyle Bushelman, Willamette Valley Outfitters, www.willamettevalleyoutfittersllc.com. 
Kyle, thanks for taking time, man. I know you've been grinding, fishing all these different fisheries and just killing it out there. How you doing, man? Doing pretty good. Yeah, we had a pretty good day today as well. Right on. Well, currently fishing a Spring Chinook on the Mackenzie River, and it looks pretty good. This run going to continue for a bit, or is it kind of winding down? We got you? Yeah, I got you there. There you go. Okay. Yeah, I'm currently fishing a Spring Chinook on the Mackenzie, and it uh, looks like it's been fishing pretty good. That going to that gonna sustain for you? Yeah, it actually is going to get better. You know, we're seeing the fish coming over the Willamette Falls, you know, we're kind of on par, a little bit behind last year, but there's a lot more fish entering the river later. And part of that was due to the conditions that you were talking about earlier at the start of the show, the cold water, the just the delay in the return. So last year we had a really good return in July. I think it's going to be great through the rest of June and through July this year again, just like last year. And uh, today we did good. We landed three nice fish and uh, hooked a few others. So it's good. Beautiful. Hey, Kyle, what is yep. your primary plan of attack when you're trying to target these fish? Are you, you know, you bobber egging it, you back bouncing, are you wrapping plugs? How are you getting these fish? Most of our fish are done back bouncing and like diver and bait. Um, we'll run a plug here and there, but with these fish, they're holding in these classic good back bouncing holes, deep runs, you know, swirl areas. And um, it's, it's a lot of fun. And so, Part of it is is teaching the guys how to back bounce a little bit, which is fun. So today we had new guys that had never done it. We spent about 20, 30 minutes learning how in some gravy water before we got to what I would call the varsity water <laughs> to get, uh, you know, because back bouncing is one of those things that it's like unlocking a box, a treasure box. Once you get it dialed, it really ups your game on catching salmon. So, um, yeah, we got it and they figured it out. It was good. Right on. Yeah, there's definitely a technique point there that you got to just kind of figure out and finesse and get that get that bait to work down river out in front of you instead of letting a diver or some other method you know pull it away from the boat. So, I can see yeah. how that might take a little bit for a newbie to uh, to master. So, well, that looks like it's going pretty well, and it's nice to hear it's going to sustain. But hey, you've also been putting time in out out there in the ocean as you typically do. Run out of right. Depot Bay, lingcod, rockfish. How's that been going? And uh, is that is that uh, opportunity going to continue for you as well? Yeah, well, if we can get the wind to calm down a bit, I mean, we've, yeah. if the weather has just been really weird offshore. I mean, usually we get a few more days. Um, you know, we, the swell is not too bad, but when we have 20 knot winds, it kind of changes the game a bit. Um, we went out last week, and it was pretty nautical. It was seven-foot swell, eight seconds. Not ideal, but we did get our limit of rock fish. It was pretty good, but... It, the fishing's good, and we're and I'm just you know to get our lings for the most part we're mooching herring. Um, it's a quick way to get our lings, and then we try we'll go after the bottom fish. We start jigging for those, you know, shrimp flies, um, you know, just all the regular stuff. And we're fishing, averaging about sixty to one hundred twenty foot of water. Most of our lings are in about one hundred and ten, one hundred twenty foot of water. And what what is the limit out there? Can you have two link cod and then you're getting your rockfish as well? Is it just primarily a link cod trip? How does that work? It's a, we're doing we're getting our two link cod and five rockfish. So two link cod over 22 inches, and then the rockfish, we keep everything but quillbacks and yellow eye. Mm -hmm. And uh, cab is start after July 1st. Yep. Yeah. So Sounds we can get normal. quite. Yeah, they they put a yeah they put a similar regulation in for the northern coast, mm -hmm. um, but they they made it applicable after May first. So they said you can't have oh, coldbacks, right. copperheads, and vermilions, and then of course yellow eye. We haven't been able to keep for for Ever. a couple decades. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, very similar. Yeah. Hey, uh, yeah. looks like I was poking around the regs. You guys got a coho opener coming up out there, Depot Bay, Winchester area bays that you like to fish uh, mid June or so. Is that, uh, what's your forecast on that? Does that look to be a pretty decent run? And will you be running, uh, you know, double trips that day? Get your get your uh, bottom fish, get your coho? What's that program look like? Yeah, you know, it starts the 17th. Um, generally, it's kind of a slow start. And the fish are kind of, you know, they're not the biggest in the first couple of weeks. But by the time we get to the end of June, the fishing's red hot for the coho. And then we will be doing the double trips where we go coho fishing in the morning, depending on what the swell looks like. If it's going to be a little windier, we'll go after the lings first and then go troll because it's easier to troll in that wind than it is to drift, you know. So oh, yeah. we kind of play the day accordingly. But this year we're going to plan on doing a lot of the combo trips, at least get our ling cod and salmon. 
and whatever rockfish we get during the ling cod hunt that's what we get they're like we kind of go after ling cod and we have the rockfish as bycatch um, when we're doing the combo trip yeah. so it's fun the salmon should be good the return should be decent but i'm not going to hold my breath quite yet they have they've missed all the all the mark this year and last year so it's kind of yeah. take it for what it is yeah well, hey, uh, he is Kyle Bushelman, Willamette Valley Outfitters, www.willamettevalleyoutfittersllc.com. Look him up at his webpage, check him out on Facebook, follow him on Instagram. Uh, lots of opportunity coming up, Kyle. Hopefully uh, you're filling seats, and if uh, you got some openings, people can find a, a way to spend a day with you because you always always put them in the fish no matter which fisher you're on. So thanks for taking the time tonight, buddy. Always good to check in with you down there. All right, thanks, guys. Take you care. Bet. Have a good one. Have a good one. All right, buddy Kyle, never... Uh, Never a uh, lack of putting fish in the boat, no matter which one he's uh, going Absolutely after. Absolutely not. So, all right, going to jump out for a quick break. We come back. Uh, Ross Walker of uh, Rods and Reels in Need. We're going to talk about this Fish Expo 2023 and why you should be there. Stick around. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back right here after the break. Fish on Northwest. Allied, the new leader in heavy gauge aluminum boats. Allied boats have standard reverse chine and lifting rakes to help you plane faster and run at lower RPMs. Allied boats have several models to choose from, ranging from a 19-foot Mustang all the way up to a 32-foot Liberator. So regardless of what type of heavy gauge aluminum boats you are looking for, Allied boats will have it for you. Contact Allied boats today to learn more about these incredible fishing machines. Sportco and Outdoor Emporium is the largest local outfitter in the Northwest since 1975, providing thousands of people affordable outdoor gear. This summer, make your next outdoor adventure more affordable by shopping at our warehouse style pricing. We are a local Scotty dealer offering sales, service, and repair. Located in Fife and Seattle, come visit us today. The outdoors await you. Welcome back here to the show. Tommy, uh, just not too far in the very near future, now that we're into June here, mm -hmm. a couple of weeks, we'll be at the Fish Expo. Yes, we will. Uh, you'll be fishing Nia Bay, but Ching and I yes. and others will be at the Fish Expo. That's right. Uh, we, got a, we got a great plan for a huge booth set up. Why? Because it was so successful last year. Figured we need to go back and uh, on Larry's invite and, and do this again. So let's find out all about it. Mm -hmm. uh, next on the program here, Ross Walker, <laughs> board member at Rods and Reels in Need. Uh, Ross, this will be the second annual Fish Expo, Fish Expo 2023, held at the Thurston County Fairgrounds. It sure will. Yeah. Last year was a kind of a trial run, an idea, and it was a great success. And this year we're looking to blow it out of the water. Uh, not only do we have over 40 awesome, unique, local, custom fishing tackle manufacturers, um, people to include the likes of Fish Hunt Northwest, mm. Wicked Lures, um, Pro Light Rods, Thurston Bay, John Fetters Jigs, uh, just to name a few. I don't want to ruin it for you as we've got a lot of awesome people there, so you're going to have to come check it out for yourself. Absolutely. So, hey, Ross, so last year was the very first annual event that you mm -hmm. guys have ever put on. It was a huge success. How do you, how, where do you take it from here? Like what can folks that are going to attend this this year, what, what can they expect? So last year was a huge, huge success. It was a one day event with um, a lot of awesome fishing tackle manufacturers. 
And like I said, this year is going to be an even better event. It's going to be a two-day event. We got a lot of the awesome same manufacturers that were there last year, plus a lot of awesome new ones. Um, we have a beer garden. We have a lot of awesome top-notch food vendors to include Flaming Pig Barbecue, Stax Burgers, oh Boogie Beans Espresso. Mm -hmm. We got an ice cream truck and a yeah. cotton candy vendor. <laughs> uh, we also have um, one of the coolest thing about coolest things about this event is the free trout pond operated by WDFW and Puget Sound Anglers. Uh, this is a re really great event for kids. And this year is going to be something unique to the first hundred participants as far as kids to the trout pond. They're going to get a free gift tackle box from Hatchery Wild Coexist. It's oh, wow. going to be awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. So you just mentioned it. You got all the food trucks, you got the vendors, you got the beer garden, you got the kids trail pond. Uh, the Saturday night evening events, uh, front and center stage, Dakota Poorman is in town mm -hmm. putting on a heck of a show. And if people have never been to one of Dakota show, he's a great friend of ours. And uh, uh, he puts on a heck of a show and folks need to stick around Saturday evening and enjoy because that's going to be a lot of fun. What do you think about that? Absolutely. Besides this awesome two-day fish expo event, um, Saturday is going to be headlined by an awesome country music concert and IPA brew fest. Um, we're calling this the Wave the Flag Boldly concert nice. to honor our military and first responders. And like you said, it's going to be headlined by none other than Dakota Foreman. And this is going to be an awesome event. You can't miss it. Fantastic. Now, do you still have room for additional vendors? And if so, how do they sign up? We sure do. Um, like I said, we have already booked 40 awesome local fishing manufacturers, but we still have a few booths left. So it's not too late to get your spot. Um, so if you're, whether you want to come down and enjoy the event or whether you want to be a vendor, you definitely have the opportunity. Thurston County Fairgrounds, Saturday and Sunday, gates open at what time and closes when? So Saturday, the Fish Expo is going to go from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Okay. with the country music concert going from 6 to 9. And Sunday is going to be 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Perfect. Awesome. All right. Well, we're looking forward to seeing you there. We're going to have a massive booth set up. Fish on Northwest will be there in force. The boat's going to be there for people to walk around and check out with Defiance Marine. We've got a lot of uh, presence. FHN will be there. Uh, looking forward to it. It's going to be a great event. Looking forward to seeing you guys. You do a fantastic job. Can't wait. So thanks for joining us on the show tonight, Ross. I know it was a quick in and out, but I think folks got the info and we, we hope we can get a lot of people there for you to help support. It's a good job you guys are doing. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Can't wait to see everybody out there. All right. Sounds good. Ross Walker, everybody, a board member at Rods and Reels in Need. Look up Rods and Reels in Need on social media platforms, Facebook, specifically, and make it a point to come out to the Thurston County Fairgrounds, Father's Day weekend, 17th and 18th. Come join us and come buy some swag. Shane's got a ton of it to put in your hands, and I, I want to see it uh, go out the door so I don't have to load it back on the trailer, Tom. Yeah, there you go. Good idea. All right, jumping out for a quick break. Don't go anywhere. A uh, little FHN quick tip coming up right after this commercial right here, Fish on Northwest. Support from Northwest Sportsmen make Federal Ammunition the world's leading ammunition manufacturer. Federal uses the industry's finest materials, giving you reliable ammunition that delivers superb accuracy and optimum performance. Northwest hunters rely on Sportco to provide the best selection and prices in the Northwest since 1985. Sportco and Outdoor Emporium in Fife and Seattle. Your journey begins here. McComey's Custom Lures are made in the Northwest for salmon, steelhead, lake trout, and kokanee. Our products come in a variety of sizes and colors to help you catch more fish. Find our products in stores or at McComey'sCustomLures.com. Yep, for sure. Oh, yeah. Big fish. Yeah, buddy. Nice fish. Oh, beauty. Gorgeous fish. Bobby's on the board. We got a good one. Oh, yeah. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, geez, come on. Nice fish. Nice fish. We're going to show you how to make fishing reels.
Hey guys, the Wedding Land Fish Hunt Northwest. Here's your FHN quick tip. So, it may be worth the expense for you to look into the Raymarine Autopilot, and here's why. I'm considering getting a bow mount electric, but I don't have one now, but I did have the Autopilot installed on the boat, and here's how easy it is and how functional this is on my troll fisheries, and this is applicable here in the Columbia River, out on Puget Sound, any parts of the Columbia River, reservoir fisheries for kokanee trout. It really puts the boat in auto mode and I can tend to gear, I can fish, I can do things, right? Really simple here on my screen. Pull it out here, look at my steer to hold, pop that, hit the engage pilot. Now I'm engaged, hands off the wheel. I can look at my sonar. I can look for boats and whatnot out in front of me. If I need to make a change or I want to change course or direction, I have one degree plus or minus, 10 degree plus or minus. So we want to go 10 degrees to the uh, starboard side, just punch that button. Now the bow of the boat's going to start shifting and we're going to go 10 degrees to starboard. If I want to do that in shorter increments, I can do a couple punches on that. You can see the numbers change. Every time I hit the button, we're at 266 degrees. Here we go. 276, 286. So, uh, in retrospect, it's just that simple to operate and navigate the boat. You are in a crowded fishery. You see boats out in front of you. You can look ahead and decide you're going to go starboard or port simply by hitting those buttons. I don't have to touch the steering wheel at all. The Raymarine Autopilot, it's an excellent option. I would recommend you look into it. All right, there you go, Thomas. A little look at uh, Raymarine Autopilot, mm -hmm. why you and I both use it. Yep. It's just, you know, to, anytime you can just, I mean, set the boat, let it do its thing, got your speed all dialed in whatnot, and you're not fighting, you know, tons of wind. And It's intuitive. Wind. It's very intuitive. And the, the other thing that I'll remind people, too, is that, you, so you've got an Axiom Pro, and so that's got the hand controls on the side, whereas yep. the regular Axiom does not have it's, that. Yep. When your hands are bloody or it's raining outside or you got mm -hmm. that just salt mist going everywhere, those controls on the side are also, you know, very nice to use yes, if the are. screen's completely, you know, uh, not an option. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, or you know, yeah, slippery with uh, wet gloves or That's things right. like that. Yeah, That's I agree. Right. So, um, but yeah, it really is for a lot of my troll fisheries, whether Puget Sound, and again, you know, it has limitations in, mm -hmm. in weather and current and those types of things and wind, but... When it's applicable and can be used, keep you on course, man, to be hands-free mm -hmm. and just dealing with your gear, net and fish, whatever. Absolutely. It's, it's a definite uh, bonus to have. All right, that is going to do it for us first half of the show here on Root Sports. Uh, appreciate you tuning in. Second half of the show coming up, don't go anywhere, going to be the Bait Lab, showing how to cure coon shrimp. Get you ready. Right here after the break, Fish on Northwest. Allied, the new leader in heavy gauge aluminum boats. Allied boats have standard reverse chine and lifting rakes to help you plane faster and run at lower RPMs. Allied boats have several models to choose from, ranging from a 19-foot Mustang all the way up to a 32-foot Liberator. So regardless of what type of heavy gauge aluminum boats you are looking for, Allied boats will have it for you. Contact Allied boats today to learn more about these incredible fishing machines. Hey guys, I'm Big Mike. Come on down to the Edge Pro Shop and see me. We've got all the best brands under one roof. We've got Hawken, Procure, Short Bus, Pro Troll, Yakima Bait, Get em Dry Jigs, Northwest Bait Scent, Daiwa Reels, North Fork Lures, North Wild, Brad's, 
Superfly, Rocky Mountain Tackle, and of course, the greatest rods ever built, Edge Rods. Hey, welcome back to Fish of Northwest. We are here in the Bait Lab. Bait Lab presentation is brought to you by Sportco or OE. Check out everything you see here, including the coon shrimp at Sportco or OE. And if you're out of the area, go ahead and get online and order up. They do ship. All right, uh, talk a little bit about uh, coon shrimp and curing coon shrimp. Yes, we are in summer, summer on steelhead season, so it's applicable. Um, the amount of time it takes once we get done with this process for them to truly be cured and ready to fish is optimally two to three weeks, prime after four weeks. So we'll be well into the summer season. Uh, could have done this you know, a month ago to really get you ready, but not to worry. Plenty of summer run season still left, and these are definitely gonna be ready for sockeye as the sockeye get to the upper stretches of the Columbia. So we're well ahead of schedule in that regard. So um, one question I often get is, hey, where can I find uncured coon shrimp? Because I want to cure them for myself. Now, one thing you got to keep in mind is, they need to be uh, flash frozen only after they've been blanched, okay? So we're looking for shrimp that have been caught, blanched, boiled, and then frozen. Raise Baits does a pretty nice job. Um, you can get boxes of two pounds of shrimp, raised Baits. Uh, these again are blanched and frozen in about a two pound bag. You can find those, um, Sport Co. I have found them at Cabela's. And you know another good resource here in Washington, whether you're east or west and they do ship, at least in the past, Columbia Basin Baits tends to have a good uh, amount or variety of different sizes of shrimp, coon shrimp, that uh, make great baits, whether you're doing it for sockeye, steelhead, and or chinook. So some, uh, some, some areas to go or companies to uh, reach out to if you're looking to find coon shrimp. So what does it take to cure them? Well, They've been, they've been blanched, boiled. So that is important because that toughens up the meat. It toughens up where the, uh, the tail and head connect at the carapace. It makes it a much more durable bait. Don't try to take fresh shrimp off the boat that you might get out of Port Townsend or one of the other ports uh, from the fishermen and try to cure them with this recipe. They're going to take on color. They're going to cure somewhat, but they're not going to be very durable in that they won't be tough. The, the, the blanching, the boiling of it, really makes a difference in how durable these uh, these fish. So this recipe I've been doing for a number of years. A good number of friends, guides, and professionals in the industry use this recipe. They might tweak it a little bit, but the basis behind a lot of it, a lot of it for them, is this recipe that I uh, put out there for Potskis years ago, for good reason. I have caught pretty much everything swimming on this, to include steelhead, chinook, coho, chum, absolutely, because it's shrimp, and sockeye, and uh, it works very well all times of the year in, in different uh, presentations, it's gonna get it done. So it's a mixture of salt and sugars, Baraxel Fire, uh, Potsky's Baraxel Fire Red. Now I like to make them dark red. I used to make them in a variety of different colors and different flavors, and I kept records over the years of which ones flat out produced time and time again. I come back to my basic one uh, go-to because it works so well, dark red, the darker the better, and anisent added to this after all the additional sweeteners, okay? So uh, this is a combination, and this is not a sales pitch. This is purchasing a handful of items from Potskis that you can cure multiple uh, quart jars of shrimp with. Um, if you price out purchasing cured coon shrimp, um, you're gonna see that they are it can be uh, extremely expensive or very expensive. So if you want to take the time to do this, yes, there's an investment. Like anything we do in fishing, there's an investment. But this stuff will last over time, and you're going to be able to cure several pounds, several pounds of shrimp on your own and uh, give that a go. So we start off, it's a combination of egg juice, uh, Baraxel fire, some, some krill powder or liquid krill. We have salt and sugars of different sizes and uh, it's just a combination and it's, it's pretty simple. In this container here is a quarter cup of each one of these products. I have refined uh, non-iodized sea salt. I have uh, granular white sugar. I have rock salt. And I also have uh, refined uh, natural uh, sugar in its, uh, in its natural state, which is a larger granule of sugar, okay? So basically this 
recipe works in that it begins to, to cure and or uh, get into the meat of the, of the shrimp early because of the small granulation. And then it also maintains and sustains for a long time. Now, there's a lot of different cures you can utilize out there, different liquids you can put to them and they'll fish for a week or two. But this cure, I guarantee you, uh, will last in your fridge. I, I have had shrimp fish absolutely fantastic. They've been in this brine in the fridge, not the freezer, in the fridge for up to four years and they continue to fish and perform uh, very well. So ultimately, uh, I know some guys that will cure this up. Uh, they'll use them a year later. They cure all their shrimp a year ahead of time because it works so well the following year. So anyway, there's, there's a number of products that go in here, but it's for the durability of the bait it creates and how long it's going to last in your, uh, in your refrigerator. So I start off with Potsky's uh, Red Egg Nectar. This is nothing more than 100% egg juice is the basis behind this. We all know how well shrimp and egg combination works. The, the, the egg and uh, sand shrimp cocktail for Chinook and other applications. Anytime you're mixing eggs and shrimp, it has a great effect on fish. This starts off with um, uh, the nectar, which again is egg juice, okay? So I put one full bottle in, and I'm gonna add just a little bit more that I have in this extra bottle here, because I know I'm gonna need it. Uh, then I'm gonna put in all the granulated products. Again, uh, non-iodized sea salt, refined sugar, rock salt, and then uh, natural or, you know, the brown un, uh, unrefined sugar, for larger granule, and then also a quarter cup of your dark red Baraxo fire. All these ingredients, the salts and the sugars in the Baraxo fire, one quarter cup of each, okay? It seems like a lot, but at, over time, it is absorbed into the shrimp, and uh, you'll end up with a little bit of product in the bottom of the jar, but not a whole lot, okay? So we're gonna do that. Stir this around a little bit just to kind of loosen it up. Now it takes, it takes a while for this stuff to break down. The early onset, it gets going, but over time, it really starts breaking down, absorbing into the shrimp, okay? Now that that's in there, we got that nice slurry going, I'm gonna start dropping in these shrimp. Now one thing I did was I slightly thawed out my box of shrimp, opened up the bag, and I separated them into two different sizes. These here are the bigger shrimp, that I get out of the packet. They're ideal for summer steelhead. They're the ones I like to use for the summer steelhead. Uh, the smaller ones that I get, and there's usually more of the smaller ones in each bag that you get, each two pound bag. Those are ideal for my uh, sockeye fishery, okay? So I start off by putting a bunch in the jar uh, so I know exactly how many need to go back in. And I don't overstuff it. I don't cram them in there. I don't want to crush them. They're kind of fragile. So you got to take care of them and not, not over crush them down into the jar, okay? Now you got a couple options. First, I'm going to add deep red color. I'm going to take some of the Potsky's fire dye. And I know that this is four tablespoons in here. I like to put in a couple tablespoons. So, you know, half a jar is going to get me uh, the color that I want on the shrimp. The other thing I want to do is I want to put in some krill powder, and typically I go with uh, two, two tablespoons of the uh, Potsky's krill powder that simply adds additional krill scent to this, and I make sure I always add that in there as well, okay? Um, now I have some, some space left in the jar. I can top that off with the red fire brine, that works just fine as a filler to, uh, to fill up the rest of that uh, uh, vacant area. Or I can top it off with some of the, uh, some more of the uh, nectar. Okay, and I'm gonna bring that up almost to the top. I wanna leave a little space to be able to move it around, stir it up, and, and make sure that it, that it stirs up real well. The final ingredient here is going to be my anise, okay? And this is gonna be a good 10 drops out of the vial all right, 10 to 15. I like to do almost a full, a full pull on that. So um, the other option, I think I'd mentioned it. So you can go with the, the Potsky's uh, Krill Powder, or you can put one bottle of the liquid, uh, the, the liquid krill in there as well. Either or is gonna get it done. So now that all the in ingredients are in here, we're just gonna nice and gently start stirring this around a little bit. Okay, I'm not shaking it violently. 
And uh, one thing I could have done is I could have put the krill powder in my uh, powder mixture to start with. Um, kind of forgot to do that, so I added it at the end. No big deal, this will all mix up just fine, but don't violently shake your jar, okay? The, the shrimp, again, they're kind of fragile, and uh, all you need to do is to mix up the, the contents in here and give it, get it evenly distributed throughout the jar, okay? Now, and you guys have seen me talk about this before, the first couple weeks, I'm gonna actually store this in the refrigerator on the side because the ingredients like to settle to the bottom. If I stand it straight up and down like this, it tends to kind of get uh, clumped up at the bottom, the stuff that isn't uh, quite breaking down yet. And it's a little tougher to get it off the bottom of the jar and remix than it is if it's, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, built up simply on the side. If it builds up on the bottom of the side like this, I can just roll it over. It breaks free relatively easily and uh, we, can, we can continue to stir that. I will go out into my bait fridge at least once, sometimes maybe twice a day for the first couple weeks. And if I have five or six of these quart jars with the shrimp in there, I'm turning them, turning them things over, stirring them up, mixing that up, because the faster that stuff breaks down and absorbs into all the shrimp equally, the faster this jar is gonna be ready to fish, okay? The other thing I'm going to put, do is put on here, uh, the date today is 6-1-23. And uh, that has anise in there as my extra ingredient. That's all I put on there. I know the date. I know four years from now, believe it or not, I could actually fish these if they stay in my fridge. But again, I'm gonna store them for the first few weeks on the side. And uh, ideally, in about four weeks or so, these will definitely be ready to fish. Guarantee you they'll be ready to fish for sockeye season coming up a couple months down the road. All right, that's gonna do it for us here in the bait lab. Hopefully you can uh, take that and uh, work with it. Uh, find some success with your own coon shrimp. If you uh, do that, cure it up, get out there and fish, get some fish. Post those pictures up on our social media platforms. would love to uh, enjoy your success with you uh, through our process of, of giving you uh, insight. All right, uh, we're going to jump out for a quick break. We come back. We're back in studio right after this. All Defiance boats are built without any structural wood materials. That is why all boats are backed with a lifetime warranty. All Defiance boats come standard with large fish boxes that are fully insulated so that you can ice your fish properly all day. All Defiance boats are foam flotation filled and unsinkable for the ultimate in safety while fishing offshore. Before you buy any boat, stop by or call Defiance boats today to ensure you are getting the very best glass boat your money can buy. If you're looking for the best fishing rods in the world, you really do need to take a look at the edge rods. I designed and built new machinery, and I think this new machinery has enabled us to build blanks like no other company could build without this equipment. There is no other rods in the world that are as good as these rods. You owe it to yourself to take a good look at them. New days, new beginnings, new friends, new loves, new dreams, new goals, new scenery, new job. No matter what the next chapter holds, Better Homes and Gardens Real Estate will be there to help you find the new that's right for your lifestyle at any stage of your life. Better Homes and Gardens Real Estate. Expect better. All right, welcome back here in studio to Winning England, Tommy Donlin. Uh, Tommy, got a couple questions here relative to the bait lab I just, just completed. Uh, are those pink shrimp or are they really called coon shrimp? Where are they caught? Uh, James, I don't know exactly where they're caught. I mean, you can get coon shrimp out here, coon striped shrimp out here in Puget Sound waters for sure. Uh, where, uh, where are the guys that uh, raise are actually getting those? Uh, I don't know, but those are definitely coon striped shrimp. I've uh, been curing them for years, and they work great. Another question, Tommy. Um, uh, let's see, where would that one go? Can you cure the frozen shrimp that you would buy from the store, the ones you can eat? So you're referring to the, the uh, tiger prawn, which uh, not only tastes delicious, but make great baits as well. Um, they don't need a lot of things put to them. It's some of the best results you have with those, especially when you're fishing for steelhead, summer on steelhead, is to leave them completely natural color, add a little salt to them to toughen them up. And, uh, but that, that white flesh 
and that uh, almost bluish translucent of uh, color it has in the water. Herzog and I have talked about it often. It almost puts off its own natural UV, and they work really well. Now, if you want to cure those up, uh, I know Bill has taken this recipe, and after all his coon shrimp are uh, used, mm -hmm. he'll have that, that cure still in the jar. He has taken store-bought shrimp, dumped them in the jar, and uh, lets them grab color, lets them grab that scent, and they fish fantastic. So it is an option. I can tell you with summer steelhead, and when it comes to putting something out there in front with a bait diver, those little coon shrimp and those beady little eyes staring at steelhead, they don't like mm -hmm. it. <laughs> <laughs> and they attack what it is you put out there. So um, good questions, guys. Keep them coming. And uh, if you got more questions in regards to that cure, it's been up on Potskis for years. Um, it's been one. It's a staple. And a, I, like I said, a lot of guys are using it, and for good reason. Um, okay, Tommy, we have a couple things to get back to here. Uh, La Push Lincoln Derby coming up. That's right. Actually, we're leaving leaving tomorrow. Yep. Yeah, it was originally postponed. We had some pretty nautical weather here. It was, right? Earlier on, yep. and so they, they made the move to uh, this weekend. Yeah. Good idea. Yeah, great idea. The weather's uh, fantastic. Looks like a pretty decent crowd is going to attend. we got a good number of boats have entered. Still time to enter if you'd like. Uh, it's out there out of La Push. Um, the event is happening at the Roundhouse right there outside of Forks. Mm -hmm. uh, Mission Outdoors is the, is the headliner on this thing. They do a fantastic job. So just a quick uh, rundown on that. Tommy, the captain's meeting uh, and dinner Friday at 5 p.m. Event kicks off at 5.45 a.m. on Saturday. They will do safety checks on the boats. Coast Guard will be there to help out with a few. Um, Folks can stop by the Roundhouse pretty much all day long mm -hmm. uh, as it's going. You can stop by the Roundhouse Friday evening, sign up your team, sign up your boat. I believe the entry fee for the for the boat and the team is three fifty, um, yep. and it's all going to a good cause. Uh, you can also simply come by if you're not fishing but want to come hang out and watch the awards and everything on Saturday. Uh, join us for dinner. Actually, you can join us for dinner Friday and Saturday. They got captains meeting dinner. They got dinner on Saturday. It's all free. Although, through Mission Outdoors, if you would like to give a, a donation for your meal, that is never turned down as it's a nonprofit mm -hmm. organization taking care of our vets and well worth your time to support. So come on out to Forks. Um, weather's going to be beautiful. Stop by the Roundhouse Friday or Saturday night. Join us for dinner. Uh, we will be there selling tons of swag. We got our new Lincod halibut. That's right. Kokanee uh, is not just for dinner logo. <laughs> yep. And the hats <laughs> right. just arrived, man. And they the look hats. good. How, how good are yeah, those? Like those that, embroidered, good. Uh, that embroidered that yeah. embroidered uh, tune-up. Blake yeah. Tooney you got. Really like the Lincod hats. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Free dinner for everyone. Come by and see us. Love to see you guys. Come by, say hi. There's going to be plenty to do. Hang out. We're going to have a great time. Looking forward to that. So Yeah. And another thing I would add, just, you know, if you're not necessarily interested in doing the derby, but you want to thank a veteran and you want to get them out fishing. I mean, contact Mission Outdoors. They'll hook you up, right? They'll match you with veterans. So, yes. so you don't have to worry about that. There's a lot of guys that um, they just want to go fishing. They they want to get kind of integrated into the to the scene that we have on the ocean. And so it's a, it's a good way to do it. Yeah. So reach yeah. out to Mission Outdoors. They can help you with that. Yeah, excellent, uh, excellent point. So um, I don't know if you caught the uh, the social media traffic here the other day. I posted up a pic. Jordan and I, I did. And his uh, buddy Sean, supervisor from work, went out in Sean's boat. Wanted to put a little time in in the backyard here. <clears throat> and I so much going on this week. I'm like, let's just take your boat. Mm -hmm. I'll bring the gear. I'll bring the bait. You know, and he he wants to learn more about kokanee fishing. So mm -hmm. I'm like, you know, it's time to get on the lake here in the backyard. Go hunt some kokanee. And mm -hmm. the one morning this week that it was crappy. I mean, it was blowing, it was cold. We had to come back in and get another jacket because we were all just like, this is, hey. You, you know what, You know what though? It's good practice for the oh, ocean, okay? Man, I'm it's good telling practice you. for the salt. I was like, I don't know about you guys. Newman, you cold. He's like, I am freezing, right? He's just over there shivering. So anyway, um, <laughs> but prior to that, right, we got out there. I'm like, well, this is, it's going to be blowing. Uh, let's just, let's just drop the gear in, Jordan, and go for it. You know, let's see if we can get any kokanee. And we're marking some schools, right? So I was a little bit encouraged. I'm like, oh, I'm just telling him to go on my the uh -huh. racetrack in my head. It's like, hey, let's just, you know, let's go find, hey, there's some schools drop down 45 feet. All of a sudden the rod just doubles over. And all of a sudden what appeared to be a steelhead off the stern comes out of the water. I'm like, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. right? Biggest trout I've ever caught out of Summit Lake here. Um, a solid four and a half pounds. You know, it's a triploid, right? Persons were saying, is it truly a triploid? Is it a jumbo? Is it an oversize? Is it a holdover? 
Look, I'm going to contact Gabe over at uh, WDFW, you know, region region uh, uh, director here, but um, our, our uh, fish manager. I just, I surmise it to be a triploid based on rounded fins and just kind of its genetic status. And also when I mm-hmm. cut that thing open, right, its entrails were just encased in fat, as you've been accustomed to when we got those triploids on that east side. Mm-hmm. They're, they're, oh, you cut it open? You cut it open? That was my halibut bait. I was taking that bait this weekend <laughs> Four and a half to drop for a yeah, hundred pound halibut. Happened. Well, you can get the grease off the oh, grill. Oh man! So it it cooked up oh. like a triploid. It tastes amazing. The the oil boiling out of that thing was yeah. sec- you know, and just the marbling in the the belly wall fat, and mm. it had no it had no sexual identification. I mean, it had, it was it was it was neutral, right? Washington trout. All yeah. Right. So there you go. Perfect. Uh, it it basically had all the characteristics of a triploid. I want to know. How many they're actually putting in the lake versus just the oversized or the jumbos or what the true, you know, what what is it, right? Because mm-hmm. it was a specimen, much like yourself. The, the, the thing that I think you should mention, which you mentioned to me earlier, was that the kokanee fishing across the state does not appear to be what we were hoping for this year, which I thought was interesting, right? Because mm-hmm. I just, you know, I think kokanee, you know, it's a landlocked sockeye, right? Um, they're planted. Mm-hmm. Um why, why would you not be able to catch them in this lake right here in your backyard Consistent this year? year in and year out, yeah. Yeah, year in and year out. It seems like you'd be able to. It uh, historically is a cyclical fishery in all bodies of water that they reside. A lot of the bodies of water they reside also have a uh, wild component to it. This lake is no exception. Uh, American Lake is no exception. Mm-hmm. Merwin. I mean, a lot of them have a wild component, right? And so the stocking is based on the abundance of wild fish as well, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. because it's carrying capacity overall. Nothing has changed here, nothing has changed in American. Herzog has fished four lakes so far this year, has yet to catch a kokanee. Mm-hmm. Um, I hadn't put the boat in, I was waiting until you know, mid-May, which got delayed until end of May, and I'm thinking, we've had some extremely warm weather mm-hmm. that really bumped the surface temp and the temp of our lakes up tremendously. Um, we're at that point now, first of June. These these fish should start schooling up. We should be able to go out there, mark fish on the finder. My sonar should be showing me schools of fish, mm-hmm. and it did. And uh, we were we were marking fish all the way down to 55 okay. feet, which you know it seems like historically out here. If I think back, I'm catching fish this time of year, 25, 35 feet down. Mm-hmm. Seeing them clear down at uh, 50 feet and whatnot. And we started catching fish, and we caught a good number of kokanee. Yeah, but I know earlier in the year, I don't know if it was, I can't remember, March, I think you had mm-hmm. gone out, and you'd got a, an ice batch of kokanee. So they're, you're saying they're there, they just, for whatever reason, are not biting. No, we caught plenty of kokanee. Right. In this lake. But the size was... But not recently is what I'm saying. It sounds like, you know, Herzog's been out. Did you get so, any kokanee the other day? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. We went out, we caught plenty of kokanee. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah, okay. but they were, they were 10 inches. Okay. That's the thing here is like, well, there seems to be decent numbers. We're marking schools. Uh, we're catching fish. We're catching fish even on a, on a line we put out with a one-ounce mm-hmm. uh, Dave's Tangle Free lead up on the okay. line, right, just to get a third line out because Newman's running two downriggers. Yep, yep, yep. That rod on one ounces, 100 feet back, is fishing between 15 and 20 feet, probably caught more kokanee than the other two downrigger rods. Okay, interesting. But they're all 10 inches. 10 inches, 10 okay. inches, right? I'm not getting into what I would say this year's class of fish. Those are next year's fish. Okay. Just because of their immaturity and the size. Now, I'm not saying that's across the board. Merwin could be kicking out fish. I just what about Chelan? I mean, Chelan is Chelan notorious is fish, for... Nope, Chelan is fishing. That is, that is one of the ones that's actually doing pretty well. Mm-hmm. You know, Sammy's been putting out a number of reports. The fish seem to be decent size. 14, do I dare say, up to 16 inches. Okay. Pretty respectable sized kokanees. Mm-hmm. A few guys mm-hmm. have uh, pulled some close to 18 inches out of there. Sound, seems like a decent year. Uh, Bobby Loomis has indicated, well, if you're going to get after it, get over there to Chelan in the next three weeks because once it starts really getting hot, those fish will be down 150 feet. That's right. Away, right? Yeah. Which is understandable. I'm just saying on the surface here, as we get through May, now we're into June, West Side Lakes, um, seemed like a decent number of fish were caught for the, um, for the uh, kokanee derby. Um, up north, but uh, you know, it's they're all different. I'm just saying these Pierce County lakes early on right now don't seem to be Kicking very active. Out what, what we would expect. Yeah, American, yeah. I've talked to a handful of guys, they're like, I just can't find them. 
Hmm. Okay. Interesting. So one other issue with that is these lakes, this one, American, pretty high smallmouth population that continues to get bigger. So ah, okay. So you think they're getting eaten? Yeah, the predation yeah. issue. So you asked why wouldn't it be consistent? Right. Predation issue on some of these is tremendous. Not to mention okay. they have stocked a ton of trout in American Lake, although uh, so many people that fish that lake are strongly asking for kokanee to be planted. If you're going to plant mm -hmm. and back off on the trout, let's let's That's bring right. the yeah, let's bring those kokanee back to what they were. That's right. right. So Yeah. I, I, it's, better uh, eating, better halibut bait, better across the board. <laughs> better for yep. everyone involved. That's right. right. So, um, yeah, it's, you know, more to come. It's early. I mean, it's June 1. You can fish kokanee all the way into the summertime. Sure. We'll see if some of these lakes might turn on. Sure. I'm not hopeful for in the backyard here if we're going to see the 15-inch kokanee I've been uh, blessed with mm -hmm. for the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. That's okay. We got Chinook biting in Puget Sound. I'm good. We got a lot of different stuff going on. We do. Speaking of kokanee, you know, and talking and, about the halibut fishery. And bait. You know, and t you, t you talking about kokanee not being, you know, what it traditionally has been over the last couple of years yeah. and it being cyclical. It's interesting because the halibut fishery is kind of taking the same kind of trend. You know, halibut fishing last year, you know, out of Westport, we started to see where we, you know, you actually had to work to get your limits of halibut, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and now off of La Push and Nia Bay, it's, it's kind of the same thing. Like if you want to get a boat limit for four five, six guys, you actually have to work, you know, mm -hmm. whereas you're not, you're not going offshore and releasing, you know, 20 halibut and then keeping your five, right? That's, that's usually what the MO is. Sure. And that is not the case that's this year. Happening. And usually the trend that we see is, you know, that first week of May off the coast, those fish are, are small, you know, they're, they're. 13 pounds, 15 pounds, <clears throat> 17 pounds. Your true average halibut in Washington state is, is 17 pounds. That is, that is that the, the true average of a halibut. Gotcha. Um, not, not large. And usually what we see though, is as the season progresses, as you go through May and then you get into June, you know, those fish, they put on weight, they get bigger, bigger models move in. You're catching fish that are, you know, not teeners, not in the twenties, you're catching them in the thirties and then into the forties, you know, you can find, move around and find that better grade of fish and, and more of them. And that's just not the case this year. Yeah. Um, even as the season's gone on and now we're in the first week of June, um, it's still a struggle. We're not seeing those halibut kind of populate those offshore areas of interest where we usually target them. Um, now on the other side of the coin, link cod, are so prolific i mean they really should think about maybe allowing you know a three fish link three cod fish limit. limit there's so many link cod you know we just never and seem to run out no matter where we fish it, i it's i know and it's, it's it's unbelievable and it seems to me that you know some of these areas that traditionally are halibut areas are inundated with link cod oh um and so i don't know if there's you know uh uh you know a grand battle of 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 food i i don't think so because i tell you what when I look at my sonar and I cruise, you know, off the top of a ledge and I go down a canyon and I'm marking all the way down to 1,600, 1,800 feet, the food source is massive. That's what you it's said. Massive. Yeah. It's massive. It's, the feed layer is 200 and sometimes 300 feet thick think about that. of bait. Yeah. And so I don't think there's any issue with how healthy the ocean is. So there's really no reason for those fish to not be there. Yeah. Um, the long liners, you know, I talked to a couple of the guys in the tribe, the long line, they're struggling too. Yeah. They're so not having not, like, it's, a, it's uh, amazing yeah, it's year, not like right? You, they're getting them and we're not, you know, the no. rec, rec guys are not getting them. Everybody's kind of struggling together and it doesn't seem to matter what the tide's doing. Mm -hmm. You know, we, and to be honest with you, we've had awesome weather days Yeah, and I've fished, um, I was in the, obviously in the Bahamas last week, but I have fished every single opener um you know on the weekend and it's it's been good so yep. really you know no complaints that way it's just that the halibut fishing hasn't been there mm. um but with that said if you know you work you put your time in you put the right bait in front of them you kind of move around and find pockets of fish you're going to limit out um but it may take you longer than you were anticipating yeah and like you said you may have to work for them yep. we, had, we had to work for them last time i was out with you yep multiple drops yep and all of a sudden you pull three and you go, yep. yeah, those we are covered, a good grade of fish. We covered uh, six in di completely different spots right. yeah. on that trip that you were now, on. Now, yeah. two weeks ago, the week before you left for Bahamas, mm -hmm. you guys, you you retained your, you had four guys, right? Uh, last, you talking two weeks ago? Yeah, or you got. Six, you, we had six guys. Yep. 
yeah, the, the halibut seemed to be decent size. They were, they were. I mean, as in like, wow, all yeah. of those fish are 40, good. 49 to 62 pounds for fish. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's a good grade of fish so, right there. Yeah, it is a good grade of fish. It's nowhere near the 17 pound average. No. But neither no. is Tommy Dog. I mean, that's, that's always the goal, right? You, you're <laughs> yeah, not, right. You're not, uh, I don't know. I, I'm getting to a point where I'm getting really bored of, of looking at, you know, a 20 pound halibut. Right? Yeah. And so, you know, you got to fish the areas where you're not necessarily going to go and, and see 30 halibut in a day, but they're going to be the right kind. Yeah. Right. They're going to be the, the larger models, want. the yeah. ones you want. And so you got to move around to find them. Uh, last week in your absence, we had Bill Herzog in studio here with me, and we did discuss summer steelhead a little bit and uh, kind of went down some tactics and techniques. And also uh, anticipating the uh, opener, which was Saturday before Memorial Day weekend. Um, sounds like a pretty good outpouring of folks participated in that particular fishery. Sounds like not a whole lot of fish were caught. Um, you know, local, local rivers here that open up. Let's face it, there hadn't been anybody on those rivers since December. Mm -hmm. Now, we're talking summer on steelhead, winter on fish have spawned and moved on, but there mm -hmm. are still downriver fish always early in June when you're going after summer steelhead. And um, what I also thought with the flows, albeit they decided to kick the dam back out here in the Grays Harbor region on, on, the, uh, on the Nooch, and so the water level dropped a couple hundred CFS, which really brought it down to some, some much lower flows, um, which would... You know, if I was putting a game plan together, I'd go, well, I'm just going to stick to the lower river then because the water's dropped and it's mm -hmm. early season. I don't see a lot of fish moving up. Um, got some reports of a few fish caught up higher that, that were uh, definitely some winter fish, a uh, handful of uh, summer fish caught. But, you know, it's not all doom and gloom if we're not seeing a lot of fish on the opener. Mm -hmm. that, that fishery sustains throughout the summer months and into September We'll still see fresh summer run coming in. So um, I'm going to reach out and talk with a few folks that are doing those surveys and really have a handle on it to see how they're gauging the uh, front part of this season as it materializes, whether we're going to have uh, decent summer numbers or not. Now, we know for certain the numbers are going to be drastically down on the Columbia River. Mm -hmm. um, that is not necessarily a gauge for overall performance in other uh, bodies of water in the state. It is a gauge, however, on how the, uh, the summer run fishery for the Columbia and tributaries of the Upper Columbia are perhaps going to perform or not uh, as we get through, you know, into the season. So something to keep in mind, uh, summer run fishing is always great. You get away because I can tell you this, when folks go out the first couple weeks and they get blanked a couple times, next thing they're off chasing salmon or doing other things, those mm -hmm. rivers can be kind of just a nice little solitude day of I've not seen a whole lot of folks and enjoying. <laughs> and sometimes float. not seen a whole lot of fish and either. You might hook one or you might not. So, you know, it is what it is. Uh, you know, take your take your uh, choice of your uh, approach and get out there and enjoy some time on the water. Uh, we got a whole summer to enjoy. So, uh, okay, Tommy, with that, uh, that kind of wraps up a handful of fisheries. Just you know, taking a look. Yeah. Kind of, kind of globally here. Collectively. What we got going. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's things we got going on to look forward to. All right, we're gonna jump out for a quick break. We come back real quickly. Gonna. Checking with you how this Tommy Bahama trip mm -hmm. turned out. Mm -hmm. And we got a, we had a couple openers today that seemed to actually perform pretty well. Yeah, on fire. And we're talking on Chinook fire. and Coho, Puget Sound opportunities. You're going to want to hear about this. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back after this break right here at Fish and Northwest. A Northwest favorite for almost 40 years, Arima boats are manufactured with pride in Bremerton, Washington. All Arima boats are built without any structural wood materials. That is why Arima boats are backed with a lifetime warranty. Arima can offer every boat with Honda outboard packages so that you can take advantage of the reliability and five-year top-to-prop warranty from your Honda outboard. Call or stop by Arima boats today and let them help you get into your very next boat. Yep, for sure. Oh yeah, big fish. Yeah, buddy. Nice fish. Oh, beauty. Gorgeous fish. Bobby's on the board. We got a good one. Oh yeah. Oh, oh, that's oh, oh. Oh, geez, come on. Nice fish, nice fish.
welcome back here, Fish on Northwest, as we wind down the show. Uh, Tommy, next on the docket here, yes, going to talk about your Bahama trip. And just by chance, Jesse on here says, hey, Tommy, how was the Bahamas? That's right. So, yeah, saw Jesse in the Fort Lauderdale airport. This and, is a guy uh, you know? This is, no, no, no. I just met him, just met him at the airport in Fort Lauderdale. And he goes, hey, you're that, you're that Fish on Northwest guy. I said, uh, well, sometimes. You know, sometimes. <laughs> and sometimes I'm in the Bahamas. And sometimes I'm so in the Bahamas. So it just depends. Yeah. But, um, yeah, Jesse, the, the Bahamas was phenomenal. Mm. Um, you know, one thing, so one thing that, one reason why I go to the Bahamas is for tuna. Okay. I will chase tuna anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't matter which species of tuna. And the Bahamas um, is kind of a holding ground for yellowfin tuna. And, and they also have blackfin tuna, but you know, the, the allure to that fishery is that it is so close to Florida, yeah. you know, to run from Hillsboro Inlet in South Florida on the Atlantic side mm -hmm. to get to the West end of Grand Bahama Island is 64 and a half nautical miles. Really? Yes. Yes. That seems pretty close. And then, yep. And then when you look at that, that large channel that's between Bimini and Grand Bahama, that that channel and that canyon structure holds a lot of tuna. Oh, and the reason that the reason I like fishing tuna all over the world doesn't matter where is that you can draw comparisons as to how you fish them, how we fish albacore here in the mm -hmm. Pacific Northwest, mm -hmm. and how you fish them down there. And so I like to fish with different people mm -hmm. and learn different tactics, and then take those tactics and apply them to our local fishery, right? And see how it works. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, this time we were with Captain Art Sapp, just well-known captain, knows his stuff. Um, great first mate on the boat, Native Son. Um, Chris, just awesome mate. And so the plan this time was, hey, let's go over there and let's see how let's see how Art runs, you know, his boat for these Bahamas yellowfin. Yeah. And um, last year was our first year going over. We right. took, you know, yep. took uh, Ty's boat over 33 Blackfin. This year we were cruising a little bit more style with a 39 CV. Oh. Um, no shortage of horsepower there. And so, <laughs> you know, cruising over there, you got to check into customs, right? Uh -huh, so we yep. go to the West End, we yep. check in, and you can't fish Bohemian waters until you check in. So you check in, right? Then you can fish, right? Gotcha. Um, and the name of the game over there for tuna is it's all run and gun. It's all run and gun. You know, you're not you're not trolling trying to cover water. You're looking for birds, right? And you're looking for um, really three types of birds: frigates, terns, and shearwaters. Huh. Okay. And, you know, frigate commonly referred to as the warbird. Because they're eating on a certain type of bait that the tuna are going to be going after? Or they what? follow the fish. You'll see the frigates up, okay. up high, and they'll be looking down. And usually when you can spot them right below them, they're watching fish. Huh. Now, if you just see a couple of frigates up there and there's nothing underneath them, then those fish are deep in the water, right? Mm -hmm. And if they're staying in that one spot, they're looking at something, but it's, it hasn't come to the surface. Sure. When you start seeing the sheer water show up and the mm -hmm. turns, mm -hmm. and they're on the water and they're looking in the water, they're basically telling you fish here. There's huh. fish here. And then obviously the complete telltale sign is that, hey, there's tuna just blowing up on the surface, right? There is that. And so, <laughs> so we yeah. take off from the west end. We're you know going 35 knots cruising. And um, we ended up covering about 40 nautical miles until we saw that first group of birds, mm. okay? We show up, <clears throat> tuna blowing up out of the water, 40, 50 pounders, we set up. Um, the one thing that I learned this trip that was absolutely cool and, and could be adapted to our fishery is um, what I call the bucket dump trick. And so you see these, you see these fish blowing up. Now usually, you know, when we approach a, a jumping school here, we keep our distance, we kind of slowly drift into them, and then we make contact, right? With this, you know, these yellowfin, these blackfin, they're moving so fast and they can be jumping, but they can be jumping in that direction, right? Mm -hmm. And so they can be moving, they can be jumping, but they can be moving 10 miles an hour in, in one direction or another, right? So you have to kind of predict where they are and where they're going to be. And what really shocked me about this particular trip is that we rolled up on these tuna at Mach 9, like 35 knots, right? Oh, wow. We come up 35 knots and we're, you know, it's like we're 20 yards away from where they're jumping, 30 yards away, which is you're really close, right? Yeah. And the, um, the, dump, the, the bucket dump trick is you take your live bait, you hook it, you put it in a bucket of water, and then you put about, 
you know, five swim, five free swimmers or 10 free swimmers in the bucket with it, right? So as you're rolling up, you know, Art will yell, hey, uh, dump it, yeah. right? Bucket goes in the water with your hooked bait, you're in free spool and the boat's still in motion, right? Uh -huh. Coming, you know, goes to neutral, you're sliding and that bucket and all that bait just kind of goes out behind the boat. And that's usually the bait that's going to get picked up first, right? Because yeah. they, what do they see? They see a big commotion, all this splashing from the boat. Fish don't always realize, well, oh, that's a boat. What's I need to, making that? Right? Yeah. What's that? All they see is a commotion, right? Yep. So the boat can also be a fish attracting device. Then you got free swimmers. You, you, you got ones that are that's hooked right. In, you right? got one that's hooked, right? Oh, yeah. And so they come up and they just start eating the bait, and boom, you're on. Wow. And so that very first school that we came up to, jumping to, and it was it was a perfect scenario. Dump dump that. Boom, I'm bit immediately. And you're thinking, right? at home, I'm gonna need more bait. And I'm thinking, <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking we can do this, uh -huh. right? Yeah. And, then, and then the rest of the program from there is a little bit not what you would expect, mm. right? It's, it's bent butt rods, heavy, heavy rods, 50 wides that put out 80 to 100 pounds of drag. Oh. And then, but you're only using a little two-odd circle hook, right? <laughs> that's forex strong and wow. then you're using pilchards as live bait and then you're also chunking them too so you're cutting them up yeah throwing chunks in the water and um the tuna are kind of eating both you know sometimes they want a live bait sometimes they want a chunk you've got four of these heavy 50 wides with bent butts and you're you know fishing three just fly lined out as you drift and then another one you put a weight on so you kind of get it deeper in the water mm -hmm. column mm -hmm. and it was interesting that first school that we rolled up on they were jumping right next to the boat you know like like from here to the house, 15 feet away, they're, they're blown out of the water, right? Uh. And our baits are, are right there and they can see our baits, but they're not eating them, right? Uh. Drifted for a while, about 10 minutes, and uh. finally we start getting hooked up, right? Get the baits a little further away from the boat, they eat them, we get two on, and then the Bahamas is notorious for sharks right oh. sharks come in yeah they start sharking our tuna yeah um they hammered one completely broke the line they got another one about 50 percent of the way right when about the sharks it. get on your on your fish then is it you just have to move you, gotta, you you know yeah when the sharks are there there's really not a whole lot you can do i mean right? if you keep hooking fish they're just gonna keep grabbing them aren't they yes to and no oh. it depends on how occupied you can keep them oh. so say i hook up gotcha i get three dusky sharks on my tuna uh -huh. okay you hook up and you're in the opposite corner okay you're you're at the other end of the boat and your tuna runs that way you might you have a chance yes. of landing your tuna you have well, a mine chance. gets absolutely destroyed <laughs> right. okay yep. um so there is a possibility that if you hook enough tuna at one time you can get them into the boat yeah and that's kind of what we did last year right yeah, yeah. Um, we ended up with some nice tuna and and that was kind of the scenario you feed them you, you pay your tax and then you land a couple, right? That's funny. But um, I would say, you know, for this trip, you're counting on the birds to be there. You're counting on the birds to work. And we only saw a handful oh. of birds working. Mm. So the tuna fishing relative to what I've seen it from last year, a little bit slow, but still really good. Mahi fishing is, is always off the charts there. So we ended up um, keeping 15 mahi. Oh. Um, I caught a Sierra mackerel off the dock that we turned into sashimi. It was phenomenal. It's the first one. I've never targeted them. Yeah. And, you know, you go to the docks there, and it's like, you, okay, think about this, right? So you go to the dock here. You can't see the bottom in 20 feet of water. Mm -hmm. The water's murky, right? A lot of plankton in the water. And you look in the water, what you do see, it's like a herring, or you might see a, you know, a shiner perch, right? Or you might see something like that, right? You go over there, and there's a 200-pound nurse shark sitting underneath the dock, there's a hundred pound tarpon swimming right there. You know, you got Sierra mackerel swimming by, you've got all sorts of snappers <laughs> swimming underneath you, it's right? Like an and it's, so it's like right? an aquarium, it's of like large an aquarium. model fish. Yeah. So it really, you know, going over there, it's a very special place, um, very special fishery. They've got a, a hell awesome. of a deep drop fishery for snappers and groupers. Mm -hmm. Um, and just the most crystal clear blue water that you've ever seen. Amazing. So, special yeah. place. Another great trip. Yes. For you and the boys. Fantastic. Yes, indeed. Awesome, man. Uh, well, in our own backyard, we had some pretty epic fishing. As of today, let's start with Area 10, right? Um, resident, Resi, Resi Coho opener that, uh, you know, go, going back to North of Falcon, is it going to be open the, the 15th, 16th, or are we going to get that June 1 opener? Right. Well, they pushed it back. We got that June 1 opener, and a handful of buddies were out there. Our buddy Matt Messing was out there with some guys, and... Uh, it took them a while, took a couple hours, but they finally found into them. They said it was just 
gangbusters. Uh, you just uh, and looks like a decent uh, decent size quality of fish there too for resis. I mean they're all pretty cookie cutter, same size. Looks like we're getting them on the old, uh, the old uh, 360 flasher course in the Herring Aid by uh, Silver Horde. Looks like uh, three, 3.5, probably, yeah, no, it's probably a 2.5 or three, hard to tell in the picture. But that, uh, that Herring Aid spoon, tough to beat that, those, those resi coho like that. They also like that pink and pink pearl. You know why? Yeah. Because they're eating a lot of krill. Yeah. There's a lot of krill up there, especially this time of year, and when you cut mm -hmm. them things open, I tell you, those, those fish are, you know, they rival a decent-sized kokanee, for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 18 to 20 inches. Yeah. But uh, not only are they fun to do, and we've done it on kokanee rods up there just to have mm -hmm. a really good time. Mm -hmm. But, man, I tell you, Tommy, and you know this, you put them on the grill, oh, phenomenal. Yeah, yeah just, super I mean, red. So red, almost Full like a oil. sockeye, right? Yep. Yeah. Full of oil. Yeah. Well, and, and best of all, the fishing's really good. Yeah, I saw Paul Kim had a limit as well. Oh, he did. Yeah, yeah, he did. He did. Yeah. So everybody's everybody's getting them right now. You like to see it start um, off strong like that. Yeah. And, and, you know, I saw the guys out there in Area 10 today and, and chasing the resident coho. And I was thinking, what are they doing? Why? Because Area 11 <laughs> yeah. is open for schnook. Right. Right. And so I started getting text messages this morning. Oh, it's about to go down. It's about mm -hmm. to go down. Yep. And sure enough, the pictures come flooding in. Yep. And one one king after the next, after yep. the next, it was on fire. The jig bite was on fire. The troll trolling fishery. was on yes. fire. Yep. I mean, I, let me tell you what. If you want to catch... A Chinook in Puget Sound right now. Mm -hmm. You need to drop everything you're doing and go to Area 11 tomorrow because yeah. there's a really good chance that it's not going to make it through the weekend. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Uh, talking with longtime friend Larry Phillips, right? Yep. Uh, he actually they had some uh, they had some folks uh, he had in town. They booked with Justin Wong, mm -hmm. so they got to spend a day mooching. Yep. Did uh, fairly well. They got uh, they did also get one coho, but they had I think he said uh, four really decent Chinook. Awesome. And uh, all mooching, of course. Yep. which is the best way to do it if you're not jigging. And um, uh, he he looked around, tried to take it all in. And, you know, he's pretty good with numbers. He worked for WDFW forever. Mm -hmm. And he basically told me, man, there's probably, well, first of all, uh, one thing they took note of, they went in and uh, talked to Fish Checker there at Defiance. And um, uh, 40, 40, what do you tell me, 43 or 45 anglers had been checked, 39 fish. 39 fish, that's awesome. So he put a, yeah. he put a factor of 0.08 uh, per angler, right? Fish yeah, per angler, 8, yeah. right? Just yeah. under one. And then he looked around, he's like, I bet you there's 600 rods fishing yep. right now, Area 11 specifically, and I got pictures sent to me, just boats everywhere. Right. 600 anglers, 0.8, so we're, we're over 500 fish in the right. opener. Right. Over 500 fish on the opener. What's our quota? 1,400 or something, right? <laughs> yep. Do I the, think do your, your estimations yeah. are right. I mean, yeah. Friday is tomorrow. Saturday, if that's what we got in the opener, of course, a lot of people, you know, called in sick today because that's what you right. do. Because <laughs> our windows of opportunity are narrow. But um, I tell you what, there was uh, there was a good number of nice-sized fish coming in, not yeah. just a bunch of cookie-cutter blackmouth. Right. So we got our margatory fish, you know, showing up in, in good numbers. And... Um, mm -hmm. The other component of that you and I were talking about before the show, which is an important takeaway, is that we're not going to end up shutting this fishery down due to high sublegal encounter. Right. We're Correct. going to shut this fishery Correct. down due to you quote, them all. quota yeah. achieved, yeah. Yeah. which yep. is one that we can't check that box all too often. Right. We get deeper yep. in the summer. Area 10 opens for Chinook in July. Mm -hmm. You know, it just, it just. We, we get up against it on some of these fisheries, man. Nope, sorry. Mm -hmm. We still got 35% of the quota to go get, but we're up against our sublegal encounter. Right. And right. that always is one that you and I grind our teeth on because yep. you just don't want to do that. We want to maximize opportunity. We want to get mm -hmm. to our quota. We want to leave the sublegals alone. Yep. This one, the, you know, we're hitting it just right. Yeah. The thing that I was really excited about, just going back to the, the fishing methods, was the number of jig success stories I heard. Mm -hmm. So now is definitely the time. You're, you've been jigging. You've yes. had success jigging yes. with, you know, our edge rods, slow pitch yes. jigging rods. So fun. With our accurate 300s yeah. and 500 ends. Yes. I mean, now is the time if you've ever if you've ever even considered slow pitch jigging. Yep. Now's the time to go get yourself and a good uh, a rod there. and a reel yep. and slow pitch jig. Yes, it's a it's a uh, it's an investment. You'll be thankful you did, and then you you match that up. I've tried a handful of the jigs. You know, I've been using yep. uh, I've been using Point Wilsons and I've been using Puget Pounders, and I have found the most success 
with that Grim Reefer mm -hmm. time and time again. Mm -hmm. There's a couple color combos that have been working. DJ's been out there with the Black Speckle. I mean, it's just been hammer time. And their, their social media blew up. We mm -hmm. put that out there a couple times, finding that success. And they're like, where? I've been getting so many messages. Where do you get the Grim Reefer? Look up Fathers and Sons yep. on Facebook. And you're gonna you're gonna find them, and they're gonna be here at the uh, the fish expo. That's awesome. You know the thing to remind people too is that with a typical rod, right? You're buying a rod for salmon fishing, or you're buying a rod for halibut fishing, or you're buying a rod for tuna fishing, right? A slow pitch jigging rod can be used for absolutely any species. So the same rod that you've yep. been catching those kings on in area 13, yep. you're gonna bring that on the bow when we go tuna fishing and you're gonna catch tuna with the same exact rod, the same exact same reel, reel. Yep. You know, same setup, yep. right? Yep. Um, you can even catch halibut with that same rod you I have, can. the same reel. And so, you know, that's that's the thing that people need to realize about these edge slow pitch rods. There, There is no, absolutely no limit to what you can catch with one rod. It's, yep. not, a, it's not a one season, one fish type no. of rod. No, so it's a crossover. It is. It, it is. handles a bunch of it for you in the salt water, albeit ocean, indoor Puget Sound. Especially when you uh, want to use, you can use it for link cod in Puget Sound as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, using it for jigs, it's designed to do what we're doing with it, and it's mm -hmm. it's working fantastic. Mm -hmm. So, uh, all right. Well, you know, uh, eleven will shut down, thirteen will remain open, and uh, for good reason. There should still be a lot of fish migrating around, trying to figure out where they're supposed to go. Um, and uh, it can be pretty good. You know, you find the bait, find the fish, stay on them. And if mm -hmm. they're not snapping, like we talked about last week with Herzog, we had to work into that tide about two and a half hours. And whatever reason, that, that pass at that time, they finally took off. And that pass, we hooked three. Mm -hmm. It's like you're marking them, marking them, marking them. Am I going to leave those fish that aren't biting to go find other fish that might not be biting? No. I'm going to keep pounding on that line. And mm -hmm. I'm going to keep going over those fish until I get to that point of the right. tide where the current is conducive enough to start moving bait around and yeah. they start biting. Yeah. And once they start biting, it might be a 30 minute window, it might be a 60 minute window, it might be two hours, yeah. but whatever it is, you're there, you take advantage of it. Right, and I think that's the other thing people have to get over too is that, you know, people people do, you know, traditional jigging with a, with a regular fiberglass rod, um, people get sick, they get tired of it, right? Yeah. They, they, they oh, my arm hurts, yeah. or I'm, you know, I just, I'm running out of energy, right? Um, with with these edge slow pitch rods that we're using, they're, they're ounces, you know, and they're designed in such a way where, you know, you tuck the butt of the rod underneath your armpit, yep. you're using your whole upper yep. body and your back yep. to jig the rod, to pitch the jig. Um, and so you can literally jig all day and not get tired. No arm fatigue. That's right. No arm fatigue. It's such a light little compact setup. Um, and just a kick in the pants when you hook a decent sized fish on there. Yep. I gotta tell you, man, it is bonkers. Them things going under the boat, having to reach over the gunnel, yep. get way down in there, be, be one with the fish, Tommy. I'm telling you, man, it <laughs> is it is phenomenal. So I can't wait to do more of it. We got plenty of season left and uh, we're gonna make it happen. So, all right, buddy. Well, that's gonna wrap it up for us this week here. We covered a lot of great content. Hopefully you all enjoyed it. Uh, make sure you take this content, share it out there on our social media platforms. Grab a hold of it, share it to all your friends, get people coming and joining us uh, each and every week and following us on social media. And of course on Root Sports on Sunday mm -hmm. at 9 a.m. is where you'll find us with a, uh, with a current and recent uh, uh, show that is uh, within time, man, time mm -hmm. within season. So, Absolutely. Um, all right, gonna do it for us here. We got a busy weekend ahead of us. Weather looks kind of conducive on some areas to get out and do something. Take advantage of it, get out, go get some fish, go enjoy, be safe. We'll see you next Thursday right here at 6 p.m. Fish on Northwest.